Can you set up uh, Robert's talk here while I, oh, and you were saying something? So, uh, so the first uh, talk, the open, opening talk, I'm not count, uh, counting my little introduction, is uh, we, uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, Robert Harrison here uh, to give the uh, keynote this, this morning. Uh, uh, for most of you, probably it's enough to say Robert Harrison, and if, if you add NW Chem or chemistry, you have a, a clear, uh, clear picture. He's very well known in the HPC community. Uh, Robert uh, did his uh, early degrees in uh, Cambridge uh, in UK, and uh, that includes, I believe, the bachelor's and um, uh, the uh, PhD-like uh, degree. And then after that, he has uh, he done several things, including he was at TNNL when he was, uh, uh, he led the development of NW Chem, the, uh, the uh, the workhorse that's been used, and many of us know also about global arrays in computer science that arose out of the NW Chem work. Um, the, uh, the, he has been at uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory for uh, for many uh, many years, um, and um, um, so. Uh, from from there, very recently, he's moved on to uh, to Stony Brook, which is which happens to be the place where I did my PhD. Uh, so, uh, and at Stony Brook, he's the director of the Institute for Advanced Computational Science, along with uh, the head of uh, at, at, along with an appointment at Brookhaven National Lab, uh, Laboratory as a if, uh, uh, as as a director of the Computational Science Center at the Brookhaven National Laboratory. So. Uh, He's very well known uh, in computational chemistry, very well known in computer science. As you will hear some, uh, some of his uh, uh, points uh, today, he, he has made contributions in, in both fields. And so I would like to, without further ado, welcome Robert. Oh, yes. Uh, so it's a, a, a pleasure and a joy to be here, and thank you very much for Sanjay of, of, of thinking of me uh, when he organized this uh, meeting. Um, I've actually uh, had uh, three or four uh, failed attempts to uh, get proposals and collaborations going, just uh, uh, I guess the reviewer community not being as open-minded about some things as one might hope, and then also just simply timing and things uh, getting in the way. So. I'm actually sort of approaching this presentation as an opportunity to describe some of our interests and challenges uh, so that uh, maybe we can find some threads of activity that we can uh, spin up to really explore, I think, what you'll very rapidly see, I think, are a set of common interests. So, uh, so that's an interesting title slide. It's not the one I was expecting to see. Um, so we might end up switching towards, oh no, we seem to have the, the right thing. So somehow the wrong title slide ended up in there, but that's, oh, we're halfway through the talk. That's interesting. Here we go. We're back at the beginning now. Good. Okay. So um, I'm... Uh, Sanjay actually gave a great uh, introduction because he, he sort of set the historical stage. And I'm, I'm going to very briefly talk about where I came from yeah. and then talk about where we are right now and then sort of briefly conclude with where we're headed, sort of what, what are the sort of outstanding challenges. And not all of those are, of course, technical, the, the uh, sort of community and agency level challenges that we have to address. So Sanjay mentioned NWCAM, NWCAM was an effort that I helped lead a Pacific Northwest lab that sort of sits under this molecular science software suite banner. And it had three components, NWChem itself, but really the interesting piece for you is, is this global array library, which is sort of was solving the parallel programming challenge of its era for that particular class of applications. And of course, those are both big caveats that we have to bear in mind. 
the motivating challenge uh, for something, some rendering issues going on with PDF on this machine. But uh, uh, one of the uh, motivating applications that sort of uh, the community has sort of largely moved on from, as you'll see in a few slides, is the was the computation of um, the Hartree-Fock uh, wave function, which is a quantum mechanical uh, method for describing the electronic system. Uh, and the key element was the computation of this Fock matrix, which takes a density matrix, uh, contracts it with these integrals, which as far as you're concerned are just four index quantities that have to be computed on the fly because there are so many of them. And because of symmetry and so on, you end up with an integral being the expensive thing you want to compute, getting contracted with six of these things and making contributions to six of the destinations. Uh, so you end up with, because of sparsity and so on, you end up with a very irregular computation. Uh, the machines of that era, so NWCAM began in 1992, had very small memories. Um, so, so actually there's an interesting mix of ages in this room. So uh, how big were the memories of computers in 1992? Big, massively parallel computers. And the people over a certain age shouldn't answer. So if, <laughs> if, if you've already got a PhD, don't answer. Some, somebody without a PhD answer, estimate immediately how much memory are on such computers. So say a big, massively parallel computer of the era of 1992. Um, yeah, OK. So a few, mega, a few megabytes is the answer, right? So uh, and of course, if you go back a little bit further, you'll get into under megabytes quite easily. So at that point in time, the big challenge, we were being forced uh, in approaching uh, massively parallel computation in chemistry to distribute our data in a way that our community had not up to that point. And uh, with this very irregular style of uh, uh, algorithm, we, we struggled to use uh, message passing in that era. And really the thing that solved it was this development of the Global Array Library, which provided a logically distributed, a logically sort of logical shared memory view of the data structure that was actually distributed. And the key thing was is it gave you one-sided access to that information. So uh, basically using uh, primitive active message-like communication behind the scenes, the application could address the data, here a dense array, uh, with the indices that made sense to the application, the indices in the matrix, uh, and get the patch of data that it wanted without the implicit or explicit communication, uh, involvement rather, of the process on the remote end. And uh, so that, we went through a bunch of different strategies to try and do this. And a key thing is that big applications like NWCAM, and NWCAM is big, uh, by science application standards at least, so depending on how you measure it, it's somewhere between one and five million lines long. And um, we focused initially on the computational kernels, thinking that was the hard bit. But actually, multiple solutions got the kernels right. The problem was everything else, right? All of that stuff, the analysis code stuff, so it doesn't have to run fast, it just has to run fast enough. But you still want to be able to have it to be easy to write. And so the goal is to be able to write fast code, right? You want, you want to be able to get that kernel as fast as you can, uh, but also to be able to write dumb code that is gonna work well enough and have it be robust uh, and not use uh, resources in an unbounded way or anything. So really we went through a few iterations and the, the Global Array Programming Model is something that uh, is, very, is very explicit from the Charm++ perspective. It very much uh, has a sense of computation is happening in a place because the model is the process gets data out of shared memory, computes, and puts it back. But uh, really, sort of for the first time in the HPC space, we could uh, reason about the performance of our parallel programs with this NUMA model, which basically with some simple assumptions about uniform distribution of work uh, and uh, avoiding communication hotspots immediately reduces the scalability question more to one of cost of communication versus compute. Uh, 
Uh, and that's basically how the plot matrix construction proceeded. I don't need to dwell on that anymore. So really, it was that success with, um, I'm just going to skip over these things. It was that success with uh, uh, global arrays inside NWCAM that moved us on to when we eventually came around a decade or so later to look at Madness to uh, pick a, a different style of programming. So the success of global arrays in, in NWCAM was the right abstraction, dense arrays, uh, and the one-sided communication mechanism. Uh, and it was deliberately a memory model, because at that time, large shared memory machines were still interesting. But if we sort of fast forward to machines now, those machines look very different. We've got much larger memories per node. We've got um, much more concurrency, not just in terms of massive concurrency across nodes, but also much more concurrency within a node. So the, there's more issues that we have to address. And we need different abstractions. The, the original abstraction inside global arrays was a dense array, a dense matrix. Uh, global arrays over the years has evolved to include sparse arrays and some other types of things. Uh, but clearly, we, we need lots of other data structures. So now I'm going to talk sort of about madness and then hopefully start to make contact with uh, stuff that you're directly interested in in the context of Charm++. So madness is started out as a, uh, an, a study in computational chemistry as we try to replace some of our numerical problems and scalability problems with uh, different, uh, address those problems with technologies from applied math. Um, and so actually most of the people on this slide are applied mathematicians. Uh, so particularly Gregory Belkin here is one of the uh, original authors, uh, or authors of the original fast wavelet transform paper, and he's a leader in the sort of multi-resolution analysis community. Um, so, although M and Madness started out trying to solve these chemistry problems, very rapidly became clear that it was relevant to lots of other spaces as well, because the high level of composition that we'll see shortly and then some of the numerical properties just m m makes it very attractive. Uh, those, that numerical framework, for much of the same reasoning that Sanjay described around uh, Charm++ and the adaptive mesh algorithms he was talking about, we, we needed to do something about our parallel runtime. And so sitting under madness is this parallel runtime that is going to be a topic of the a piece of the talk. Uh, but we also want to do something about this issue of complexity, because um, certainly HPC has performance elevated to a number one correctness issue. It's, it's on par with your program giving a correct result. It also has to run fast. Uh, but again, how fast is fast it is, uh, a, a, again, a relative question. And at some point, uh, productivity, meaning can you get the science done at all, becomes the, the driving uh, question rather than uh, performance. In, in the end, you, you want to get the science done first, and then performance is something that uh, you have to pursue uh, as a second case in, in lots of scenarios, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to skip over those. So numerically, Madness is pursuing uh, fast algorithms that scale correctly are numerically robust because a fast algorithm that is inaccurate is uh, useless. Um, and so our goal was to replace these basis sets that any of you that have interacted with electronic structure people will know about uh, with uh, other basis sets that give us much higher accuracy with uh, reduced scaling. And, and again, we want to address this issue. What, why is it that our programs are so large, uh, and yet uh, our, uh, our, pro our equations that under underlie all of this are so short? So let me give you a flavor of the very highest level of composition of a program within Madness. So this, this program over here basically just computes the electrostatic potential of a Gaussian uh, to some finite precision in this box. Uh, and the first step is to project this essentially analytic function 
into a numeric representation, and, and it does that basically just by uh, a, a adaptive refinement. Then we solve Poisson's equation, but we do it not by iterative solution of the differential equation, but by convolution with the Green's function, here symbolically represented as operating with the inverse of the Laplacian. And the key point there is that that's, that's a fast algorithm in the sense of think about the fast multiple algorithm. You're basically there directly applying the Green's function convolving with the, to the compute the electrostatic potential, just convolving with one over R. So there's really the only these two steps that are doing anything useful here, but it, it gives you the flavor of the high level of composition. Here's a more complete example that is, is again showing now iterative solution of some equation, uh, some computational chemist. This is sort of a now a complete program to calculate the hard drop wave function for the helium atom. And there's sort of two key, two key aspects to this. One is, um, uh, this is doing it to this guaranteed precision. The default precision is 10 to the minus 7. Uh, and it's doing it with some guarantee of scaling. So it, it's guaranteeing that each, e each of these computational steps is scaling linearly in the size of the system that we're operating on. Um, and that's really just what I was saying here. Uh, sitting behind Magnus, uh, sort of three key numerical techniques. Uh, uh, this, te this down here, uh, basically this is just a singular value decomposition that separates input and output indices from an operator. And we can uh, construct low rank uh, representations of these to some guaranteed precision. This is the generalization of that to higher dimensions. And it, it was basically constructing separated representations of these operators that gives us the ability to scale into higher dimensions. So madness is routinely applied uh, up to, say, four dimensions. And there are some people doing sort of more heroic work up, up in the six-dimensional regime. Uh, so uh, we're not up in the hundreds of dimensions for which you sort of have to get into the Monte Carlo type uh, frameworks. But uh, for, for numerical computation, six dimensions, I assure you, is actually pretty high. Um, this multi-resolution is actually the key thing that is the focus for, for the next bits of the conversation. And it's basically saying that imagine I've got a sequence of uh, numerical spaces. And uh, for simplicity, think of a coarse grid and successively fine grids. We can write our finest approximation as the coarse approximation plus corrections at each length scale. And it's this decomposition that is sort of the hallmark of uh, multi-resolution analysis. And it's basically, you can basically think of, imagine a function that's kind of wiggly here and is smooth over there. Then at a, a, a coarse level of refinement, uh, your smooth piece is accurately represented. But you need to go to deeper levels of refinement to represent the wiggly bit. So what that means is that your smooth bit might be completely resolved by uh, you get down to level one, in which case, in these different spaces, all of the coefficients in the smooth part are zero or, or negligible. But maybe in the wiggly piece, you've got to go all the way down to level n. So what you can see now is you've got a basis for sparse computation. And that, that's the essence of, of essentially the functionality of wavelets. Um, and that's the name for this thing is the telescoping series. And so the key thing that distinguishes multi-resolution analysis from, say, multi-grid or fast multipole is that instead of computing with your most accurate representation, you're computing in these different spaces. And, and the wavelets are the things that live in the different spaces. Uh, but having said all of that, you're computing with an adaptive mesh, right? And uh, actually, uh, all of your familiar intuition about adaptive meshes go on. Th this is a picture of, uh, I think, a molecular orbital of the benzene dimer, the benzene molecule, the edge on here. And you can see it's just an adaptive mesh. Inside each of the boxes, we have some basis functions. Those are most usually chosen as Legendre polynomials, which are a very familiar orthonormal basis set. Uh, but you can forget about the wavelets. Once you've had the insights, uh, that wavelets give you about the numerical structure and sparsity, you can actually throw the wavelets away. Okay, so enough about that. Let's go on to actually sort of how we compute. 
So think of, a, think of an adaptive mesh uh, and uh, represented as a tree. So we've sort of got a box at the closest level represented as a node here. And now we divide our domain into two pieces uh, with the, represented as a node on the left, a node on the right. And then we can just do adaptive refinement like this. And we end up, end up with some tree representation of our mesh. Uh, and in the sort of wavelet view of the world, there's a dual representation of that, which is uh, uh, we, instead of computing with coefficients that exist only on the leaves of the tree, we can construct a representation that has uh, now the sum and differences at each level, uh, between levels, uh, represented now in the interior of the tree. So we have here the wavelet coefficients in these yellow boxes, and the green box represents the top of the tree that actually has uh, additional coefficients. Uh, and so now we need an algorithm that goes from one form to the other. And so here's the uh, compression algorithm that goes from this form up into this compressed form. So this is the fast wavelet compression algorithm. And it, it's a classic tree algorithm. We just simply pass coefficients up from leaf nodes to the parents and sort of recursively do that until we've summed our way all the way to the top of the tree. So it's a nice, friendly tree traversal algorithm. Uh, addition, uh, so we want to now add two functions. Um, addition is a very simple uh, operation. It basically computes the union of the two trees. You can actually do it in either compressed or reconstructed form, but in the it's easiest to do it conceptually in uh, the uh, compressed form because now we just simply literally add the coefficients together and a missing box we just treat as zero. So we just end up with the union of the two trees. Uh, we want to differentiate the mesh. Uh, here, imagine applying a central difference operator. So to say uh, differentiate this node, I need the neighbors on either side. Well, if I'm using, say, zero boundary conditions, then the implied neighbor to this node is just zero. So this node has all the information it needs to differentiate itself, and we can compute the result. But this node doesn't. Over here, this node doesn't exist. The tree's more deeply refined. So it has to differentiate itself on a finer level until we eventually find the neighbors down here. So now this, uh, this differentiation algorithm involves uh, uh, a, a adaptive refinement of the tree. Um, here is convolution, which is uh, a very critical capability because it gives us, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to solve very efficiently and accurately certain classes of differential equations. Uh, and you can see here that basically, simplistically, what we're doing is computing uh, at each level of the tree, and each, each node on the tree computes a contribution into its neighbors. And here I've represented a simple Gaussian kernel indicating the weight of displacing by one neighbor or two neighbors or three neighbors. And the, so we're computing to a finite precision. It's that finite precision that gives us sparsity. Um, so again, you can see that the structure of the tree can change. It can become uh, truncated in the case of a smoothing operator if you're convolving with, say, a Gaussian. But if you're convolving with an operator that instead uh, introduces higher frequency, the, the tree will become more deeply refined, not less deeply refined. Um, multiplication is another operator I don't have represented here. But you can think of uh, the simplest case of multiplication is multiplying a function by itself or squaring. So imagine a plane wave, e to the i omega x. If you square it, you get e to the 2 i omega x. So it's double the frequency. So nominally, you need a more deeply refined mesh in order to represent the square of a function. You don't need to refine the mesh everywhere, because in some spots, you may have oversampled. So what that means is, again, you get dynamic refinement. So that led us to uh, developing a, a new uh, runtime to support madness. So this started probably in about 94 or so, uh, when new generations of big computers were being deployed at Oak Ridge. 
and we wanted to get stuff up and running on those machines pretty quickly. Uh, when I said 94, uh, I probably meant 2004. Um, so then um, other challenges that we had were, was we, we needed to integrate our code into existing packages like NWCAM and so on. Um, and the uh, adaptive refinement was a key challenge. Um, in a traditional sort of numerical mesh uh, code, you're working with one mesh uh, that has maybe multiple properties defined at each node. Uh, in, in our case, we had, uh, say we're solving a big electronic structure problem, we might have thousands of functions, each with its own independent mesh that evolves completely independently, has different spatial localization properties, and as we've seen, each of the operators that we have in the multi-resolution code can change the adaptive refinement in a very dynamic way. And after some struggling around, we uh, came up with a runtime that was sort of basically informed by uh, things that were going on around us. And really, uh, we intended to be very minimal with the goal all along to be eventually replacing it. So our interest is, of course, in doing the science. We don't want to be developing the runtimes. Uh, so we've got three or four key elements in this that are all very familiar to you. A, a key one I is ultimately somehow we have to maintain interoperability with the rest of the code base around us. Uh, Futures to most physical scientists are very unfamiliar things. To you, I think they probably are very familiar, but they're sort of the, one of the lowest level pieces of glue that we have in the code. They're now uh, more pervasive, um, but basically, um, uh, we can, a, a, a future is basically the result of an un, un, possibly unevaluated expression. And we're, we're using futures to handle latency wherever it comes from, whether it's algorithmic latency. So here we're representing uh, the result of a task being fed as an argument into another task and with that uh, dependency being tracked at runtime. Uh, clearly it could be a communication or an IO operation. So we've just unified all of our uh, latency handling into the single vehicle of futures. And behind the scenes, we're just using the simple callback mechanism to handle all of that. Uh, within, uh, so what that means is our tree algorithms actually uh, end up being very nice to express, um, but actually very painful to express for people such as chemists that aren't used to thinking about programming using futures. So when we get to the higher levels of madness, uh, actually, uh, we, we don't typically expose the futures at all. In fact, in fact, I think at the very highest programming levels inside Madness, there's only maybe two or three places where a science user would see a future popping up. Um, we need to build a variety of data structures, and a, a key aspect to that is to be able to uh, uh, have uh, some uh, uh, build different namespaces and have some uh, uh, simple infrastructure to handle the communication. So what we have here is uh, built on top of our futures and a simple uh, active message library. Uh, we build this class, this world object class, that basically allows uh, uh, a program to simply declare this object A, and then this object A uh, has the infrastructure built in to send uh, messages uh, between uh, uh, the same instance of that object but on different processors. Uh, and so on top of that, we can then start to build other capabilities. So here we uh, simply make uh, a distributed object uh, and invoke a task on process P that's going to invoke this method with some arguments, and the method's just stubbed out up there. But th this method doesn't have to be aware of uh, uh, 
the fact that it's uh, embedded in the class is deriving from there. So it gives us a very, very easy mechanism to do essentially method forwarding. Uh, since this is basically a, a distributed uh, entity, we've got to worry a bit about overhead in uh, trying to handle destruction and, con and construction of it. And basically, we defer all the destruction until. Uh yeah, sure. That's correct. The return, so the. No, B, no. B, it's just on process P, we're invoking its instance. Yes, right. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, actually let's skip on to this one, this is a, a little more complete. So this example here uh, is, is a distributed array built on this capability. Uh, basically, the, just the key thing is the array inherits from the world object, and then we have uh, a, a method that computes the owner of an element i, which process owns it. Uh, a method uh, to read an element, and here we've got C explicit forwarding. So if it's not local, forward the request to uh, uh, somewhere else. I'm sorry, that's here. Otherwise, return the result. Uh, and then we have writing. Uh, and then in the main program, we're just simply using it uh, with complete one-sided message passing in a here when we're constructing it without any regard to locality. And then down here, just doing random reads and so on. So here, this is again a very explicit uh, uh, approach. You see the, the programmer still has a sense that the, the program exists on a node uh, and is addressing distributed resources. So at this level, things will look, look a lot more PGAS-like. Uh, one thing we learned from NWCAM is we have to pick the abstraction that matches uh, the application. And the application wants to speak about indices that make sense to it. Um, and those are much more than just simple arrays. So here, uh, uh, we sort of learned, I think, I mean, Charm++ certainly uh, led the way on this. Uh, uh, so basically, we have to be able to construct namespaces so that where we can address objects uh, again with names that make sense that make sense to application. So in our adaptive trees, that's essentially the level of refinement and then the translation in each of the dimensions. That's the unique index that identifies a box, uh, and so that's a very sparse, uh, multi-dimensional array in, in which we're embedding the tree in. So basically. Th these are just uh, essentially just distributed hash tables, but then the user can provide a map that maps a key to the owner. Uh, we used to have the ability to sort of dynamically move data around, but that ability in the end wasn't used that much, and rather than support the code, we just simply deleted it. But clearly, resource management is a crucial thing. Uh, so wh what we have right now is sort of static phases of computation and then we dynamically uh, redistribute the data in between those phases. So when we do that, just simply by redefining this map. Uh, but basically, so with this distributed hash table, instead of referencing a process or P, here we're representing whatever index or quantity the arrays in, uh, the application is interested in. And again, now we're doing uh, forwarding. So now we're into computation that looks a, a lot more charm-like in that we've got messaging between objects that are living in namespaces. Uh, how is all of this implemented? Well, of course, none of this is rocket science. Um, the uh, simple mechanism that we have is we spin off a thread that is using MPI. On the Cray, we had a portals-based implementation. On the IBM Blue Gene, there's one using its active message library. Uh, so there's, there's one or more threads serving incoming active messages. Uh, there's a multi, there's a task queue that's served by a pool of uh, threads. And then there's the application logical main thread. And presently, we still have uh, 
at the sort of numerical layer of programming below, again, this uh, MIMD programming model, where there's an activity immediately spun up at the beginning of program execution on each process, and that's, that persists until we're complete. And so that's the application logical main thread is driving things. Uh, uh, at some levels of the application programming model, it looks more like there's a logical main thread in the entire machine that spawns off activity across everywhere. So that looks a m lot more like, say, the, some of the HVCS programming languages view of the world, like, say, Chapel or uh, X10. So um, the the, uh, the main model for concurrent execution within a node is uh, a cache oblivious uh, tasks. So the main thread will spawn some tasks into the queue, and these tasks can make more tasks. Uh, those the tasks that are ha uh, have some outstanding dependencies are basically just a pending outside of the queue, and when eventually dependencies are satisfied, they're put into the ready queue to run. Um, and uh, we can, you can think of this world object that as basically an MPI communicator with some additional stuff to carry the information we need with it. And so you can obviously have many worlds run like MPI communicators that instantiated at the same time that intersect with the process or node that you're running on, uh, all of their logical task queues are mapped onto the same underlying uh, multi-threaded task pool so that we don't end up oversubscribing processes. Uh, so within a node, there's one task queue that serves all of the activities going on that, on, on that node. We do have some crude capability to gang schedule multiple threads together so that we can switch into, say, a mode where we want to execute a parallel BLAS operation or have some more manually decomposed set of LPNMP code or something. Um, but I'd say that that's a, a very crude capability. So most of our work is cache oblivious computation with all of the baggage that comes with that. Does that answer the question? Or? Okay. Uh, and actually, so we did have a, a work stealing implementation that uh, vanished when uh, Vinod went to work with AMD, which was frustrating. Um, so, so the runtime, uh, where are we here? The, this multi threaded queue is worth spending a bit more time talking about. Uh, the original task queue that we had was written for um, the Cray uh, XT4 uh, that had, uh, uh, I think, 12 uh, cores on it, of which, realistically, you, you'd want to use 10 for computation, one for communication, and then one uh, left free for other purposes. Uh, so it was designed to scale up to that level, but cl clearly that's far short of what you need now. Um, and uh, again, there's work supporting all of these things. So we're actually in the process of, of replacing that with Intel TBB. We've had a, a working prototype version on top of TBB for a couple of years now, uh, but now we're adopting that as our production vehicle, and we're, we're going to move some of our um, internal data structures also to onto the equivalent TBB construct so that the internal concurrent hash table, some of their atomics, and so on. So actually, that's the way we typically run now, because uh, in as I was describing our, our old uh, implementation of this queue, 
uh, didn't scale beyond, say, 10 processes or so with 40 cores, that's exactly how we run it. We, we run multiple MPI processes per node w with those queues constrained. Um, and the, um, there's relatively little performance impact from that. And there's relatively little replicated data within the numerical layer, so there's not too much of a penalty. Of course, when you get to the application layer, the application itself may be replicating data, so there could be penalties there. There, there are, uh, and that represents a bit of a problem in migrating to TPB that has a, a simpler view of priorities. Um, the, we used to have uh, multiple levels of priority. The, the, the main ones that we rely on right now are, are uh, uh, standard priority and high priority. The standard priority are essentially computational tasks that are going to compute a result and just store it somewhere. The high priority tasks are typically ones that are uh, either generating more concurrency or ones that are satisfying uh, remote requests for data. Um, so the, what, what applications do we have running on top of this right now? We've got some molecular electronic structure. That was pretty, pretty much our first success. Uh, but actually, the biggest success we have right now is in nuclear physics. Uh, this is, a, a, again, sort of a density functional application, but it looks very different to the applications in chemistry and the workload. It, it, it ends up being very different. The, the main challenge here is in, in chemistry, we typically be constructing a few hundred or thousand eigenstates. A few thousand might be uh, sort of on the typical large end. Uh, here, because uh, the nuclear physics ends up having uh, elements in the density functional that involve superfluidity, they end up needing many, many more eigenstates. So if a chemistry problem wanted 10,000 eigenstates, the nuclear physics application is going to be wanting 100,000. And so it's, it's really pushed us to redesign uh, some lumps of the code. Uh, we have a, a, a nascent activity in the area of solid state, uh, and that's in collaboration with Argon National Lab. Um, uh, oh, that's right. This is PDF, so we don't get the movie. Uh, we have uh, some time-dependent uh, time evolution activity. Um, this is a collaboration that started with Matt Reuter uh, when he was at Northwestern. He's uh, subsequently moved to Oak Ridge and then back to Northwestern. Uh, but this sort of emphasizes the uh, ability of the code to handle very deep adaptive refinements. So here, the scale is nanometers, and this is a, um, a gold tip, a gold nanoprobe above a silicon surface. Um, and in, in the gap, uh, you wouldn't, there's no practical reason to do this. Matt was doing this just to demonstrate that we could do it. He has a hydrogen molecule sitting in the gap, and he's resolved it all the way down to the structure of the hydrogen nucleus, which is now down in the picometer regime. So that's all handled very smoothly in the code. And part of what makes this possible is the, the, the basis set itself, is a Legendre polynomial basis set. So it, it's, a, it, it's an orthogonal, very numerically stable basis. And uh, the fast wavelet transform itself is an orthogonal transformation. So in a regular adaptive mesh code uh, with a non-orthogonal basis, th there's a, a small loss of precision as you go down uh, levels of adaptive refinement. But even if you're, say, only losing one bit as you go down a level of adaptive refinement, once you've gone down 60 levels, then you've essentially lost uh, a whole load of information. Uh, this is a, a representative application in 6B. There's no need to dwell on it. A, a, a key aspect is uh, and now we're into different types of data structures. So this is what's called a partition singular value decomposition. Uh, and I won't talk about that. So um, the, what we see then is we chemistry codes, I think, and this is representative of many uh, different types of applications, I believe, are, are going through uh, a continuous phase change. In addition to wanting to use the very biggest computers that are available to us, we want to use different numerical algorithms, uh, different solvers, uh, fast solvers that change our 
uh, computational problems from dense matrices to sparse matrices to trees and now introduce a lot more irregularity into our computations and now we have to sort of look at different ways of composing our applications and different ways of organizing ourselves because we certainly don't have the ability to do all of this stuff ourselves. It, it's, uh, so I'm a computational chemist and uh, I sort of collaborate with the computer scientists and applied mathematicians because I've been very lucky to have most, much of my career in the DOE lab system. But there are actually very few people like Sanjay out there in the academic world that uh, uh, make a you know, serious career length commitment to uh, take his intellectual energy and uh, uh, help advance the, the cause of the science applications. Uh, so somehow we have to figure out how to, as, as communities, move these things forward. Uh, part of that is uh, this uh, sustainable software initiative that uh, NSF has, and the, one of the, the largest components of that are its idea that it could set up institutes in various communities to help be focal points for software development, I think in a very broad sense. Uh, since theory and software are so inter intertwined, somehow uh, we have to uh, in include all of this together. Uh, but the sen uh, what NSF had were a couple of years ago was a call for what it called conceptualization grants. So it funded uh, a dozen or so groups to uh, uh, develop uh, a community-wide perspective and consensus about what an institute might have. And if NSF uh, gets from these uh, activities a compelling vision of uh, what uh, a, a community would benefit from this and that uh, uh, the community shares a vision uh, and that it would have a huge scientific impact, then NSF could potentially be soliciting this for proposals uh, in these spaces. And these will be significant centers on the scale of the applied math institutes that are uh, somewhere between five and $10 million a year, and will conceivably be very long running on the time scale of uh, 10 or more years. Um, and really this last point here is that certainly in, in computational science, physics, chemistry, sociology, you pick the discipline, somehow we have to prepare su students with a set of skills. And, and that set of skills is such that they should be able to sit in this room and understand large lumps of what you're saying. And that's certainly not the case right now. Uh, the words over decomposition and asynchrony would mean very little to your typical chemistry student. And, and yet maybe they need to know those words, or, or maybe they don't. Maybe the answer is that rather than human beings writing code at the level of charm plus plus, maybe there's a higher set of tools that are, are going to be writing charm plus plus in the future. And that in itself is also an area of sort of intellectual research and so on. Okay. Imperative? Yeah, indeed. So we have activities in, in that space too. Uh, um, I, di I didn't show some of the code generation activities uh, that take the very highest level of theory that we have. Yeah, sure. So the, the, the uh, uh, question, uh, or initially an observation, was uh, that everything I spoke about was based on imperative programming models and wouldn't uh, functional declarative approaches be uh, also suitable? And, and the answer is most certainly yes. And I, I'd say that uh, th there's been some great proofs of principle that it would be very worthwhile, but uh, there simply hasn't been the core expertise in the field to really make much headway with it. So uh, I'd be very interested in pursuing a conversation and trying to make connections.
this sort of bimodal distribution, the, uh, there are some tasks that are on the order of uh, a few, maybe tens of microseconds that are mostly sort of bookkeeping tasks, uh, managing dependencies and so on, remote communications. And then uh, the computational tasks can be probably on the order of uh, hundreds of microseconds to tens of milliseconds at least, maybe substantially longer. Um, but the, the, the queue itself w it was just simply, it's a very crude implementation, right? So we're switching to TBB, so that problem is, is gone. And uh, r really the, the big problem that I see uh, within the, I, the, the three poster child problems within Madness right now are excessive global synchronization, uh, Basically, uh, some of the algorithms that we're using require global termination detection, and that's inefficient. Um, resource management, I mentioned that uh, we, uh, the lack of ability to support it, deleted the complexity, the code that was handling uh, automatic migration of the data, which means that the application needs to worry more about it. Uh, and then third, I think a problem that is confronted by all codes, which is, uh, simply handling, handling intra-core concurrency, which is mostly simply vectorization. Thank you very much.